Right. Okay. So I've I, I've titled this uh, little presentation "Badging for Success" because I suppose what's the point in doing something if you haven't got some kind of a goal in mind for for measuring uh, how good or bad it has been. So this is based around a case study into designing and implementing a digital open badge scheme on an undergraduate module in first year of a civil engineering degree. So they're very much embedded into uh, a degree process for our undergraduate students. They weren't really issued for staff CPD or anything like that. They were very much for the students. So just uh, as a little bit of an introduction into GMIT to give you some context for us, we're based in the west of Ireland, as you can see on the map there. Um, we've been established for coming up on 50 years now. Uh, we're technically an institute of technology, but there is a rebranding thing going on at the moment where we're working towards uh, becoming a technological university. So uh, we're currently an institute of technology, but that, may, that title may change. It's a multi-campus uh, institute. We have uh, a number of campuses spread across the Western region, ranging from a couple, of, uh, three of them in Galway City to uh, Castlebar in Mayo and Letterfrack in the West and Mount Bellew in East Galway. So we're spread out quite a, quite a bit. It's a multidisciplinary university or institute of technology because we deal with all kinds of programs from science, technology, engineering, some humanities, business studies, a broad range really. In fact, there's over 100 courses at various different levels throughout the institute, ranging from apprenticeships to undergrad degrees up to postgrad, including doctorate level. Currently, we have about 7,000 students working in the institute. Uh, that's going to be very different this year because they're not all going to be on campus because of the, the restrictions at the moment that you're all aware of. Uh, but we have about 7,000 students registered with us at the moment, about 700 staff. Roughly half of that would be academic staff. And now we have badges. So where did the badges come in for GMIT? Well, there's a bit of a timeline on this really. I suppose 2015 was when I first came across badges. Uh, when I went to a, a keynote address that was given by Dr. Doug Belshaw in NUI Galway. And that was the first time I'd actually ever heard of a digital badge, but something just kind of resonated with me. And I thought, yeah, there might be a bit, there's, there's something to this, you know? So I tried it informally with one student uh, that year. He did a, 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 a test for me and he, he got like, I think 98 or 99% in the test, but that test only comprised 10% of his actual module grade. So it, it kind of got lost. The fact that he did really, really well at this, at this particular task got lost in his overall final grade. So I produced a badge for him called Best in Class at that particular piece of software. He later went on and used that badge when he was applying for his job and his employer actually reached out and told me that the badge made his CV stand out. So that was my first kind of foray into it really. In 2016, I kind of formalized it a little bit more where I started into my doctoral studies. Uh, phase one, which I'll go into detail in, in a second, uh, took about a year. 2017, then phase two began, which was the actual implementation of the design of the scheme. And then uh, just this year, the doctoral study was published after a successful VIVA. So that's kind of the timeline for it. It's relatively new in GMIT, but back in 2015, there was nobody else, it was just me. I was the only person using them. Uh, and even, even at that, um, you know, a few people knew about it, but didn't really understand it. So I suppose I was breaking a bit of ground really for GMIT, for the staff uh, there. So the context for the study is that I wanted to look at how badges could be used in a year one computer aided design module. Now that particular module is kind of recognized. It's been difficult for learners because it involves skills and techniques that are, are brand new. It's not something that somebody would come from second level with experience of. So it can be con considered to be difficult um, a learning curve for that module. And therefore there was quite, quite a high um, uh, kind of failure rate on it. Um, as well as that, the, why did I pick year one? Well, the student experience in year one can be tough anyway. So I wanted to see, could badges be something that will maybe soften the landing for them, soften the transition into higher education from maybe living away from home for the first time. You know, it can be tough for people. So I wanted to see, could, could I encourage them and just make it a bit more of a pleasant experience for them. Historically, the civil engineering degree has lower de than desired retention rates. And because of that, the Institute Management made a call about four or five years ago for staff to come up with novel approaches to try and increase or, or at least to address the retention problem. 
Uh, that has changed over time. It has, it has gotten better, but back when I started this, retention was probably one of the overarching uh, reasons why, why I wanted to look into the use of badges. So let's have a look at what the research was trying to address then. I'm just going to show you what the, the research questions were really. First of all, is what role do key stakeholders, and I included staff, students, management and employers in this, uh, see for digital open badges in teaching and learning within higher education? The second research question was, what processes and practices enable participatory digital open badge use by students and teachers? And the final research question was, how do digital open badges impact on the learning, learner motivation and engagement and in institutional teaching processes? So quite a clear set of research questions, really. First of all, looking at how do people view open badges? Then how can we implement open badges? And then the third one, what's the impact of implementing them? So quite a clear kind of structure to that. What I was really hoping to zone in on was the third question though, because motivation is linked along with a lot of other things, of course, uh, to retention. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, retention is something that we were tasked with uh, addressing in the college. Now, I didn't want to bite off more than I could chew with this because retention is such a complex thing. It's, it's way more than just motivation. There's socioeconomic backgrounds, there's family issues, there's relationship issues, there's all kinds of different things, financial, that can make a student drop out, most of which we don't have any control over. But I kind of felt that the one thing we might be able to influence is motivation. So if we can increase motivation, we might be able to help retention. But I didn't actually study retention itself because it's far too complex. So um, how did I go about this then? Well, I took a mixed methods approach within a framework of action research because it was done over two phases. Um, and the first phase really addressed the perception of digital open badges from those four key stakeholders that I mentioned earlier on. So that was a very collaborative process. I looked at students and I included first and final year at this stage. I also consulted with lecturing staff, institute management and an employer. And I looked at how all of those different stakeholders interact with each other as well. So really, the first phase was all about what do you think about digital badges? What do you think the value is? Is there badges we should include? Is there badges we should not include? What do you think about leaderboards? All these different types of things. Were, the questions were just thrown out there and they were, they were asked to ascertain what do people see as being valuable. So in phase one, the students were uh, incorporated using online surveys, a learning journal and semi-structured interviews. And the lecturing staff, institute management and the employer took part using semi-structured interviews. So they were the research methods that I used in phase one. As a brief overview to summarize what stage one kind of looked like, um, I was able to kind of come up with some key findings on this, you know, that the functions are that they add value to a CV, they might motivate, um, that they enhance feedback, you know, things that you might say, well, yeah, I, I think that's obvious that a badge might do that, but I needed to find out, I needed to ask the questions to see what people thought. There was two distinct roles that were kind of found from this, that there was a designer role where the students really preferred the idea that lecturers should do it rather than, rather than them designing. Um, but collaboration in the design process became, uh, became important or come out of this has been something that was worth considering. Uh, and then in terms of issuing the badges, the students again preferred validation from their, from their, their staff, from the lecturers, because they didn't really want to see themselves issuing badges to each other. Now, you'll see later on in my story that that actually changed, that peer issuing of badges became far more valuable to the students. But at the early stages, uh, they didn't really, didn't really see it as being important. Um, and there were some challenges identified. You know, how do we trust that the badge means what it means? Validation, how do we know it came from GMIT? And misunderstanding, would a badge be misunderstood as a degree? You know, could somebody read a badge and, and maybe think that it's something that it isn't? So there were some challenges identified as well, but generally speaking, after the initial phase, people were very positive towards it and it was clear that it was worthy of further investigation. So that brings us into phase two then. So in phase two, the focus shifted to the implementation of the badges, not so much the badges, the design of them as such. Um, the basis for this was that I designed a badge pack as a result of phase one findings and also in, collabor in conjunction with the literature review. Um, and where phase one focused on staff, students, 
uh, institute management and an employer, phase two focused entirely on the year one students. And the idea there was to measure the impact over a longitudinal study so that they were uh, surveyed at the beginning of the year, they were surveyed at the end of the year. So I was able to make comparisons over the, over the course of a uh, seven or eight month academic year. So only phase, uh, sorry, in phase two, only first year students were involved. Okay, so this is um, what the digital badge starter pact looked like. And this was rolled out during the academic year 2017, 2018 for the computer aided design module. So again, just to re reiterate, this was within a year one undergraduate module. It was entirely centered on that module. It wasn't anything to do with CPD for staff. It was just for the students. So this is how it looked. Um, I'm just going to move that over there. So that's what the badge map looked like. Now, all of those badges came out of the literature review and they came out of the consultation with the students uh, and staff and, and management and the employer. So they're, they're a result of phase one, really. And I'll talk you through what each of them kind of mean now. So across the middle here, we had the high achiever badges. Now, I designed the graphics for this myself. I'm not a graphic designer, so don't go too, don't go too hard on me, but I, I, I kind of wanted a bit of a design structure on this. So basically anything that's hexagonal is a high achiever, and that was open to any student who got more than 80% in a given assessment. There are two kind of milestone assessments on the module, one at the winter test and one at the end of the year. Uh, so I created a best in class badge for the winter test and the end of year CAD project. So only one person in the class was able to get that one. That was just to create a little bit of competition, I suppose, really. Uh, then in between consecutive assessments, we had the improver badges, which were really for anybody who got an improvement in grade between two consecutive tests. So it didn't matter if they didn't get over 80%, if they got 40 in assessment one and 45% in assessment two, they got the improver one badge. And that was for inclusion of people at all ranges of abilities. I didn't want this to become an, an elitist type of a thing. I wanted badges that were available to everybody really. So it did encourage the students who weren't at the top of the class, uh, it gave them a little bit of confidence that, you know, I am getting better, I can push on now and I'll do even better in my next one. And, and th th those were the type of comments that came out of the interviews with the students afterwards. Uh, and then we have the level up badges. So with the level up badges, they're available to any student who wanted to kind of prove to themselves that they were able to do better. And the way they worked was if a student did an assessment and felt, you know, I didn't have a great day at the office, I really know that I can do better. What they were allowed to do was resubmit the, the assignment to me. I would then evaluate it, I'd give them feedback on it. And if their second attempt was better than their first attempt, they were eligible for the level up badge to prove that they wanted to get better at it um, for self, uh, self development purposes. Um, that, that idea of the level up came from the students in phase one. One of the students said, you know, when, when I do an assessment, I always do a second version myself because I want to see, can I improve? So I kind of thought, okay, let's try and formalize that a little bit. I'm going to tell you a little bit more detail about that badge shortly because the, the employer absolutely latched onto that badge as being probably one of the most valuable on the whole map. Uh, so it really shows a dedication to self-development, I suppose. Uh, then we had the buddy badges. So the buddy badges were available to students by peer nomination. And essentially the mechanism there is if a student is helped, they can go online, they can make a little, fill in a little nomination form and they can say, uh, my, my friend helped me with this particular task and I'd like to nominate him uh, for a buddy badge because it was, it was really useful to me. So they were issued by the students as part of a peer learning, uh, to encourage peer learning, I suppose. Um, I also then included what I, what I termed the mystery badges. And the reason for this was I kind of thought, no matter how well I've done phase one, no matter what suggestions I've taken on board from the stakeholders, what if we've missed something? What if something comes along during the year and I think, oh, I should have had a badge for that. So I created mystery badges as a little kind of a safety net for myself. Um, as it turned out, they became important because they, two, two of them became attendance badges and the third one became a best mentor in class badge. And the best mentor in class badge was endorsed and designed in collaboration with a local employer uh, who basically looked at the badge map and said, of all of the things that are on there, I want the person who's got the most buddy badges. 
You know, the employer wasn't interested in best in class, wasn't interested in someone who's getting over 80% in their assessments. They wanted somebody who can get on with people. So the person who had the most buddy badges was given one of the mystery badges, which became the best mentor in class badge. So that's how, that's how the badge map looked. And I'm not going to go through each of them in detail because as you know, from your experience with badges, there's a lot of text can go in here. A lot of evidence can go in here. So I'm just going to highlight the three that kind of come out as being the most important uh, for, for future development, really. So the first one was the attendance badge. So this was available for a student who attended every single class in the first year CAD module in that year. And you can see here that it kind of makes it clear to the reader that there was 78 hours of training involved in CAD. So straight away, an employer maybe who's taken a, a student on for a summer job knows that this person has done 78 hours of training. Uh, the quality could be argued over, but at least they were in class for 78 hours of contact for uh, tutorials in CAD. So that's an important one. Another reason why that's important is that the Institute manager said that, you know, there are going to be good students in the class who are going to pass anyway. Uh, and they tend to maybe not come to class because they think, well, I'm going to pass. But if they had been attending, there would have been good support for everybody else and maybe challenge the lecturers a little bit, which would have helped the whole class. So here we see another role for this attendance badge where it encourages people to come to class who are really good uh, and who may decide that they don't want to go because they're going to pass anyway. Having that high level student or high caliber student in the class raises the game for everybody. They don't have any real reason to go, except now if they have an attendance badge, they have a reason to go because they're going to earn it and it might be useful for them when they go looking for a summer job or whatever. I keep saying a summer job rather than employment because remember this is a first year cohort. So the level up badge then, and the description for that uh, goes into a little bit of detail about uh, what was actually involved in the assessment and the fact that the student undertook extra work to improve their performance on the assessment. So again, the person who's reading it gets an idea of exactly what was covered in that assessment. And it mentions down here a little bit that uh, the earner of this, ba this, this badge has shown that they're motivated to improve their CAD skills, even where a great reward is not available. So that tells you something about the student if they're going looking for this badge, even when they know they're not getting a great reward. So this is what the employer said about anybody getting that. He said that the individual that takes that on, knowing that his original grade on paper doesn't change, but he knows himself that he will improve, I think that's really good. And I'd be looking out for that individual. That's the individual I want working in this organization. So here we can see the employer giving feedback at the end uh, when they were asked to reflect on the scheme. And this was one of the badges that they saw a huge value in. And the last one that I'm going to look at in a bit of detail is the buddy badge. So with this one, again, there's a lot of text. I'm not going to ask you to read that there. Um, I know this has been recorded, so if you want, you can pause it and read it in your own time. But essentially, this badge is based around uh, peer nomination for little events where students help each other out. It's, it's, a, it's an activity that I would have seen regularly happening in the class anyway, and it's something I wanted to encourage, but I had no real mechanism for doing that up until now. So just to let you know what the Institute Manager said, that engagement is more important than attendance, and that's why she likes the, the peer learning one, uh, because she thinks that as a lecturer, you see students sometimes completely tuning out because they're tired, but as soon as you put them in groups and get them to respond to their peers, they're suddenly engaged again, and that's why the peer thing is very important. So here's an engagement mechanism coming out from the, the presence of a, a digital open badge. And that is one of the things that uh, links in with motivation to, to kind of influence retention. It's engagement and motivation are two of the things that we might be able to control. So the Institute manager had something to say about that badge, but the students also had something to say about that. And I thought this was an interesting comment. You're able to take information in, process it and share it with someone else and give them a way that they might be able to learn. So when I learned something it might be different to the way another person learned it. I'd be able to take it in, turn it around and show them in a way that they'd understand and they'd be able to use that information to help someone else again. Now, isn't that fantastic that the students are able to digest the information and reshape it so that they can share it amongst themselves with a view that the student who got helped is then able to help somebody else. I mean, I think that's just absolutely fantastic. 
so that's what the badge map looked like. I always say to people when they're at the, the, the webinars in, in GMIT that don't be scared by the fact that there's 17 or 18 badges on here. You know, start small. This just happened to be the scheme I come up with as a result of a year of studying what I should include. So some of the key findings from phase two, I'm just gonna have a little sip of my lemonade here for a second. Some of the key findings from phase two then, all stakeholder groups uh, are able to recognize multiple values for the badges. You know, no, no stakeholder group came back and said, I think you're wasting your time here. 13 different roles were identified for the badges, which surprised me. I wasn't sure that I'd get that number out. I, I've read various different literature that comes up with seven or eight or maybe even nine or 10, but 13 I think is going just a tiny bit beyond what I, what I would have read in the literature. Uh, I wanted to see what was a way of enabling participation. So I actually found seven different ways that we can include to make sure that in our design process that we can ensure that, it, that participation does actually take place. So the badges were generally seen as a positive addition to the module by all of the stakeholders. And this is important, I think. The students reported changing behavior as a result. I've had students say to me, I came to the class for two reasons two additional reasons other than the, the reason they should be there. Number one, because of the mystery badges, we didn't know if there was going to be a badge available that day, so we wanted to come in in case we missed it. And the second one was, I knew there was atten an attendance badge available if I didn't miss any classes, so I came into the class. You know, so I mean, again, to come up with a mechanism that makes students come to class, I think is just, it's a huge outcome from this, you know. I also did some statistical analysis on motivation. I'll, I'll show you the tools I used in a second, but the, the kind of the, the spoiler alert here is that uh, motivation in terms of interest and enjoyment has been shown to significantly increase over the time span of when the badges were implemented. One of the things I like to kind of include at this point is that the, a word come up in the semi-structured interviews at the end of phase two that I had never heard a student use before in my class, and that was intrigue. The presence of the mystery badges added intrigue to the module, you know, but that's an emotional response that in my 11 or 12 years of teaching I'd never come across before. So again, I think very positive finding. And certain badge types have been identified as important for future implementation. And the, those are the three I showed you on the previous few slides. So we've got the buddy badge, the level up badge, and the, um, what was the third one now? The attendance badge. They're the three I think that are, I would always recommend to people try to include those ones if you can, because they seem to have worked very well in my context anyway. So I mentioned that there were 13 roles. I'm not going to go through each of these in detail. We can chat about them afterwards, but uh, we've got increases to engagement and motivation, mapping progress, generating interest, reassuring the students, indicating uh, potential to perform better, proving the capabilities in areas that aren't graded. And I think that's important because if we're already issuing a grade to students, then you might ask the question, what's the value of a badge? Are they not going to be just happy with the number? And I, I certainly think that there's a case to be made that, uh, you know, if they're happy with the number, they, they may not need the badge, but the badges can fill in the gaps and those gaps can be hugely important. To signify prestige, you know, the buddy badges, if you're nominated, that's, that's good. And also best in class, you know, proves reliability, the attendance one, marks respect from peers, encourages altruism, you know, where we have students passing on knowledge that, they, that can then be passed on to somebody else. You know, these, these are all things that the badges have done. Uh, providing a confidence boost, they're a vehicle for cultural change that relates to how we talk about attendance has up until now in, in GMIT, and I suspect in many other institutes as well, been centered on language such as, this is what's going to happen if you don't attend. It's quite a negative way of talking about attendance. Now we have an, op an opportunity with the badges to turn that on its head and say, really, as well as all of the benefits of coming to class in terms of your potential to pass, you also have an extra re reward here now. So it allows us to talk about uh, attendance in a more positive way. And the last one is that it prepares for ongoing CPD post-graduation. The employer really liked the idea of the map, the badge map, because it, it kind of echoes in a way the type of development that you will take as a, as a graduate, and particularly in, in the field of engineering, where you may want to become chartered, 
you have to undertake several hours of training every year. Uh, and, and this kind of gives the students a practice run at that type of CPD. Uh, so we've got enablers of participation then. So what actually makes people take part? Uh, so first of all, I think consultation with the stakeholders at the design stage is very important. You're getting early buy-in from everybody. Then consulting with the students before and after the implementation itself, you know, just to get the feedback and see what works and what doesn't work. And they feel involved then. I think ensuring that all students have an opportunity to obtain some badges is vital. And that's where I thought the improver ones and the buddy ones, you know, they're not associated with the best in class. So it gives people a chance to actually earn them, even if they're not at that kind of elite level within the class. I think allowing students to make nominations uh, really engages them. Uh, they feel a little bit of ownership then. And it gets them talking amongst themselves about badges as well, including a variety of ways. So they weren't all about attendance or they weren't all about doing well in an assessment. There's lots of different mechanisms for, for uh, how a badge can be earned. Giving the students control, uh, and again, this kind of crosses over a little bit with the peer nominations, but it also uh, want, wanted to kind of reiterate that students have control over the badges after they've been claimed, you know, as you know, from your experience with badges, they can do whatever they want with them. And I think that's important. And then review and modify every so often, you know, just stop and think, uh, is that badge working? Do I need to make some changes? So they're the kind of seven steps that I've identified that enable participation in, in a scheme like this. So I just want to talk very briefly about motivation and how I used it in, in, the, in the study. There were two distinct theories that I used. The first one was achievement goal theory, which identifies the type of motivation. So I don't want to oversimplify it too much, but they kind of tend to land in either intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. And the achievement goal theory helps identify whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic. What you're really looking for is intrinsic. You want them to be intrinsically motivated. There was no significant change in the values over the trial period. Uh, so I didn't see any real change there. But I think that was because there was a relatively high tendency towards intrinsic motivation from the very beginning. So it was going to be difficult to see a change there because they were already quite highly intrinsically motivated. The second measure that I used was the intrinsic motivation index. Now this one identifies the level, not so much whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic, it measures the level. With this one, I was able to find or show a significant increase in intrinsic motivation due to the interest and enjoyment of the module. And in interview, it became clear that that interest and enjoyment came from the presence of the badges. There were also minor increases, but not statistically significant uh, in intrinsic motivation due to perceived choice and usefulness of the module. So the, the students felt they had choices in the module um, and, and they liked that. And I suppose it was the choice of whether they go for the level up badge or not, you know. Um, but, you know, the headline there is it was a significant increase in motivation due to interest and enjoyment. So going back to the key questions then, and I suppose, you know, the main kind of heading for this has been badging for success. Was the trial a success? Well, I think if we look at the key questions, uh, it might help me frame the answer to that. So the first research question was, what role do stakeholders, students, staff, management and employers see for digital open badges in teaching and learning within higher education? Well, I was able to find 13 roles. So there's definitely a lot of them. Some of the roles overlapped between the stakeholders, but multiple value propositions emerged. So I'm calling that a success. I was able to find the roles that the different stakeholders uh, wanted the badges to work for them. So stage one is a success. Uh, research question two, what processes and practice enable participatory digital open badge use by students and teachers? Well, I was able to find seven ways that participation can be encouraged and enabled. Uh, three badges emerged as being important for future implementation. So I can't at the end of this say, well, great, I've got a doctorate out of it, but there's nothing else now. That's it. That's the end of the road. I've actually identified three I think are important that anybody and everybody could use. So I'm calling that a success. And the final research question, how do digital open badges impact on learning, learner motivation and engagement and institutional teaching processes? Well, to summarize that, a significant increase in motivation was found due to interest and enjoyment. The badges incentivize and reward behavioral change to engage in the module. There was a range of badge types that can easily fit into practice. You know, again, it's simple that anybody can incorporate this into their teaching and learning practice. Uh, so I'm calling that a, a success as well. 
So the next steps uh, for us in GMIT, um, a new role called Digital Open Badge Champion for the Institute has been created and uh, I'm going to take a, a well-deserved bow, I think, because that's me. Um, that was created in January of this year uh, to, to help facilitate workshops for staff on, on digital open badging. So I've run a number of webinars on the basis of that and that will continue into the future as well. So um, around 70 colleagues are now interested and have taken part in drop-in clinics. Uh, this is going now from five years ago where it was me by myself to a point where I've got about 70 colleagues uh, of that 70, I'd say probably somewhere in the region of 15 to 20 are very active in it. The rest are interested, but maybe not, maybe they haven't taken the jump into doing it yet. But we have established a working group uh, to set up a policy and a framework for scaling up the, the, the badging practice while maintaining quality and standards. It is a challenge. It's a huge challenge. I see, uh, you know, rolling out a badge that's branded by GMIT you know, who owns it, who says the student deserves that, uh, who, who, has, who has created it. There's, there's a kind of a control and a, a, a policy that's needed for that uh, around quality. Um, but I don't want to strangle it either. I think a degree of flexibility has to be left in there for, stu for staff and even for students um, to come up with ad hoc badges that they think, all oh, right, that, that's a good idea. Maybe we should badge that and encourage more people to do it. And I think that kind of ad hoc flexibility could be stifled with a, a policy guideline if it's too restrictive. So it's a work in progress, but it is definitely a, a next step that we need to take. So thanks very much for listening. And um, if you want to contact me, I'm going to leave some contact details up there. You can reach me at any of those particular contact points. Um, yeah, and I think that's the end of the slideshow, so I'm going to stop sharing and go back into the video call. So thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you very much, Wayne, for this great presentation. Really, really, uh, I, I can't find the words, but I said that quite the equation, I, I'm sure that are, are coming. First of all, I wanted to, to ask you uh, about, uh, so what was, in my opinion, very interesting here that you, you basically you, you, didn't, you didn't speak much about badges as, as credential. I, I love that because I think that uh, badges are more connectors. And then you, you are speaking about badges as connectors, as connection tools, there is a social a, a aspect. And um, I really love the fact that, uh, the, that the employers uh, were, uh, gave big value to body, uh, badges, which is interesting that the employers we are not so, I would say, interesting in, in I would say, uh, cold facts about some skills, but more about this social interaction and re recognition by, by peers, which is uh, great. And uh, I also really enjoy the idea of motivating students to basically take the class, challenge the teacher, and, 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 and then bring a value for the learning community which is, in my opinion, great and missing in many universities, it's, it's a challenge. Many, many students think that they can pass the course, but just, just get the book from the library and they don't go you know, uh, to the courses. So I think it's very interesting. But I have a question about um, employers, because it's often with universities, the question of badges, okay, uh, you can use with students, you can use with teachers, but how could we get employers involved. So the question, how did you get employers involved in your, in your process? It's, it's a very good question. Um, we're, we're quite fortunate in, in GMIT in the sense that we're a higher level institute, but at the same time we work on a slightly different platform to a university where we would have uh, maybe more of a practical um, focus as well as a theoretical basis. Uh, so all of our degree programs in my Department of Building and Civil Engineering have a three-month placement in third year. So we have a lot of very well-established relationships with employers already. So it was quite easy to tap into uh, connections we already had. Okay. So I, I, for anybody who's not in that particular situation, I would say it's a matter of reaching out and seeing who's interested if you've got professional bodies. In Ireland, we have a, 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 a partnership called the Institute, sorry, Engineers Ireland. Uh, 
So if I was going to do this again and I didn't know any employers, I would probably go to the professional body and say, do you know any companies that might be interested in this? There's always ways to find your foot in the door a little bit. And I suppose it's like anything, just accept the fact you're going to get rejections before you get success. I was quite lucky that I got somebody on board very, very quickly because the employer I, I um, engaged with is quite a part of a quite of a progressive company, a large multinational company. They have about six thousand people working for them globally. So he could see um, he could see the reason for doing this very very quickly and clearly. So I, I got lucky, I suppose, in that sense. Okay, very interesting. Did you use the endorsement uh, feature to get the employers basically recognizing the badges? Did you send I, endorsement I, requests or? Yeah, I, I took a kind of a lower tech approach to that, um, to be quite honest, Eric. What I did was I got the employer's logo and I incorporated that logo into the graphics of the badge okay. uh, as opposed to actually an endorsement in, within the text. So yeah. the earner of the badge was able to show that and it was linked to the engineering firm that uh, helped me to develop it. Okay, very good. Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's a good solution also. I mean, if, if you have very good connection with them and you get their logo in the badge, but it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, they were happy. They were very happy. And they actually offered the recipient a day in the design office and they treated him like royalty when he went down there and they gave him lunch and he got into looking at all the different departments. So now we have a first year student who's already got a little bit of a foot in the door with a multinational company and he uh, knows now what they do, you know, so it's given him a bit of an introduction to them as well. Yeah. And that link to employability is something that we don't normally get in a first year scenario. So I think it's very progressive that that happened for him at that stage. Very interesting. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dan. Uh, Dan, do you want, you have two questions basically. Do you want to uh, to ask to when your questions? Okay. Hi everyone. Hi Dan. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> turn the, let me turn that off. I'm not set up for green screen. Um, so I have a, actually three questions, I think. One of them is just, uh, it's a simple technical question. What were the mechanics of uh, issuing the buddy badges? So if students wanted to nominate another student, were they actually issuing a badge or were they asking you to issue a badge on their behalf? Mm. That's a very good question. Yeah, thanks for letting me clarify that. We use a, a VLE in, in our institute called Moodle. I'm sure you've, you've heard of Moodle. Um, and within that, I created a task where every week I had a topic based on a week. So every week at the end of the class, I had a link in there that said, if a classmate has been helpful to you today, consider nominating them by clicking here. And when they clicked on that, uh, it brought them to a form where they could fill in their name, the, nominate, the, the, the nominee's name, and they had to write a couple of sentences to describe the learning event and why they felt the person deserved the nomination. I then reviewed those and uh, they, they all seemed kosher. They were, they were things that I was able to see in class happening anyway. Uh, so anybody who got a nomination got that badge, but I had to issue it based on the nomination that was typed in. Okay, great. I, like I, I was, there weren't large class groups. Sorry to cut across you for a second, Don. Just no. to explain, uh, I had maybe thirty-five to forty students in this class, so it was quite manageable for me to manually do that. I was only looking at maybe a dozen or so nominations over the over the course of the of the year. Right. Okay. So that uh, no, that that sounds good. So there's this new capability, and I thought <laughs> it's 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 new. So you must have had some other way of doing it. No. Um, Okay, so uh, the second question, I think you answered, it was all about balancing engagement versus portable recognition. And yeah, I think you touched on that with, with the extrinsic and intrinsic uh, uh, value of it, um, and the engagement of it. Um, the, other, the other question though is students sharing badges. I mean, one of the pushbacks about badges for engagement is that uh, they're typically, they're not very portable. And um, you could have in some audiences people inappropriately sharing badges, you know, show, you know, sharing a jumble of badges that they earn in a class and expecting an employer to look at them. Um, did you guide students at all in terms of um, how these things might be used to uh, provide signals to an employer about their employability? Uh, how, how was that dealt with? Uh, yeah. Bearing in mind these are year one students. 
Exactly. And at year one, you know, they tend not to have things like a LinkedIn profile, which I suppose is a, is a natural fit for some of these, if you think of a badge as certification. Um, no, I didn't really give them guidance on that. I left it up to themselves. And I think that goes back to giving them a choice, really, as to what they do with the badge. They can sit on it and do nothing at all, or they can share it on Facebook. And one or two one or two students did tell me that they shared them on, on Facebook, but it was interesting at the interview stage, one guy said that he definitely wouldn't share it on social media because he doesn't want his life reduced to the number of likes that something gets. Um, so that was an interesting comment. Uh, so I let them kind of resolve that issue for themselves, Don, to be quite honest. But the initial, the very first badge I ever designed was for that student who got a really high mark in an assessment that would have been lost in the, in the noise of his final grade, a single number final grade. That student actually was employed, I didn't realise it at the time, was employed by the employer that took part in my study. And when I was interviewing the employer, he said, oh yeah, I remember seeing a digital badge coming in when that student applied for his job. And I did click on it and I did read it and it did make his application uh, stand out. So they, they, they were kind of left to their own devices on it, to be quite honest. And the vast majority probably didn't share them because that wasn't necessarily the role of them in first year. It was more of a motivational confidence building tool that I was looking at. Um, and the vast majority of students were happy to get the badge, but maybe felt that they got enough satisfaction out of getting it without having to share it. Great, thanks. But I can see that certain badges absolutely would have a huge value in the sharing of them, uh, but maybe not in year one. I could add some less so comment, one. but uh, this, this point, uh, with students it's often difficult to basically get them to open an account in OpenBash Passport, go there and share the badges and so on. Well, what I did was I created an onboarding badge. So from day one, they had to create an open badge passport account. Okay, cool. yeah. um, so they had, I knew that when I was issuing badges to them, they had somewhere to put them. Okay. The good news is that in a few weeks, let's say, I hope in two, three weeks maximum, we launched the, the app, an app for getting your badge straight in your phone. So I think it's real. In your context, I think it could give some added value. Oh, that's great. I, I didn't realize that. That's good to hear. Yeah. So you will receive your badges in your phone and you can basically even earn a badge from, uh, from the phone and, and see what other badges have been earned. And the great. endorsement feature will come a bit later. But we are very excited to, to see what kind of impact it could, it could have in, a, in the context where, where you have you know, young, basically, users or, you know, for uh, associations or students, university students. So. Great, that's a good idea. Any other questions? I look in the chat. Uh, we don't have some some more questions. Did you don't? If if you if you don't mind, I'd be happy to comment. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you for this presentation. I, I've been looking forward for a very long time to hear from you, Wayne. And that, that's nice to hear. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I just lower my hand. Um, it was really interesting points that that uh, kind of. Oh well, at first I have to say that it it was really nice to notice that those thirteen same roles that you have found are the exact features that I have recognized in my studies as. Uh, but I have described those as the different steps of the process. So the approach is a bit different, but the result is the same. So yeah, I'm really looking forward that we could write something together because sure. yeah, we, and, and I think that we already have a similar kind of materials that we have been collecting from the students and the lectures and also from our uh, working life partners as well. Mm. Um, but a, a few questions. Um, yeah, I, w I was interested uh, about that something that you had noted that we haven't been able to notice was the value of the attendance badges. And yeah, as you explain it, it, it totally makes sense. However, we, we are not, not yet at that stage. We have created this kind of working life badges for our students in the university. And we have been testing those for a year and a half now. Um, however, 
Um, however, this kind of value that you have explained that working life partners would find in attendance batches, you know, uh, we haven't been able to imagine and, and it has been, it, it was very important result that you have been following up those batches as well. Um, but I do agree that um, for our students, there's a specific value on those batches as they, as they got to partner also in the first year of the university studies uh, with working life. And yeah, it's essential. Um, and uh, some points from your scaling up project that you are doing. We have been working with the same kind of project in University of Oulu and other universities. In Finland, we already have these national programs, but they are mainly intended for the uh, secondary education. So for the universities, these programs are new and now we're scaling up. And it would be really interesting because we have been uh, following through different kind of steps in our university and all the difficulties that we have faced during this process. We're actually writing an article on these kind of issues that, yeah, did you really know that it takes a whole year within the university's brand management to agree what kind of batches, the appearance, the graphical appearance of the batch, how it yeah, should yeah. look, that it would match the official guidelines of the press, you know, the colors and all the stuff we yeah, need yeah. to decide. So it's it's that kind of process that it actually doesn't have anything to do with the pedagogical design of I the and that's, yeah that's, that's, that that's exactly i mean you, you you've hit the nail on the head there that's the exact thing that i want to avoid in gmit because i think that can really stifle the whole scheme yeah yeah uh, and that's where i think there might be a way of doing it by having kind of different levels of badges where some might be classroom based and the, the lecturing staff and the students can negotiate those themselves and they're, they're low level, low currency, but can still provide encouragement and confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, working up to higher level badges, which might be branded by the institute. And I can see when branding comes in that we have to be very careful about quality control, but I wouldn't like that to be the only way we deal with badges because it could definitely restrict any flexibility and creativity. Okay, yeah, but you know, we have created a tool for that. We have this kind okay. of new dynamic uh, user interface for our material banks where all our teachers are able to create their own batches, except for the final one. Because if you want to grant an uh, attendance batch of a whole uh, study program, you know, the final participation batch, so then it will be the official with the official guidelines of the university and there will be the university logo and stuff like that, that you okay. have graduated now as the doctor of educational sciences, for instance. Sure. So, yeah. But that makes sense because yeah. it's only for branding, basically. It doesn't give any other uh, information for working life or anyone else, only that you have graduated from this university, from this program, and that's it. Yeah. So, yeah, but interesting phases and and definitely an interesting study and yeah i'll i know already that i'll spend several nights with your with your uh, dissertation in the coming next winter uh, I, I wish you luck <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but thank you this was an excellent presentation thanks uh, thank you very much yeah thank you sam do do you have any other questions uh, on the chat Still a few, few minutes for question for when? Just to say it was great, very enjoyable, very interesting. Uh, so well done. Thank you, Ian. That's, that, that means a lot coming from you because I know we, we, you, you got me started on this road. So thank you. Oh, you've done a, a great job. It's really, really interesting. Well done. Uh, I have a question about this. Uh, one, one other question now when you have engagement and motivation, uh, you have good contact with, uh, with uh, enterprises, with companies. Do you plan also to have, uh, to, to build an ecosystem of batch in the in Galway uh, area? It's uh, it challenging, but... Um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's on the radar, but I suppose my, my current 
project, I suppose, is the designing the scheme and the, sorry, the design policy and guidelines within the Institute. Uh, I want to get that right because then I can get more lecturing staff involved. That's my initial goal really. And then um, the, it, once we go outside the Institute, the, the next natural place for us to look would be the professional bodies to say, how do you see these coming in? What do you want our graduates to be able to do? Are you happy maybe to endorse one for first and second year students? Because the professional bodies really tend to only get interested after graduation. And I think there's a role for them to become involved earlier with the students. Uh, so that would be how I would see moving it outside the Institute, would be looking at the professional bodies and what they, what they can bring to it. Oh, uh, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. It's a natural next step once you go outside the, the boundaries of the college, you know. Yeah. And one thing you could also do, what helped me a lot in, in Finland, is that since you have such a great example to provide with everyone, um, we set up a tour within our home university and we were starting to telling stories for our great successes within secondary vocational education. And you know, even the concept is different or the, or the context of the education is different. Uh, the results speak for, the sem for themselves because we, we are, I, I actually work in the uh, School of Professional Teacher Education, which is in, based in the University of Applied Sciences. So the, as we train the teachers, the example was quite enough for the university uh, lecturers as well. So we went round all the faculties within our university and with these similar examples, in a brief presentation that you shared with us, a uh, similar kind of, they got excited. And then we opened up an open group in teams to discuss different views on batches and things like that. And now we are having actually in all our faculties, different kind of batch projects. And we keep sharing information, sharing good practices. And yeah, you have mm. such a nice example. So by explaining that to you. So it, I'd say it would be a huge success. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, get, getting the word out there and getting people excited about it is the important thing, really. Um, and that's why I, I kind of had professional bodies in mind when I was beginning. And that's why I, I included employer from the very, very beginning of this uh, before I even sat down to think about what badges to include. Uh, and that was one of the things that made my doctoral study unique because when I did my literature review I think there was a there was about 120 or something articles that, on digital open badges of that I think three had even met only three had mentioned employers and none of those three had actually involved employers in the design stage so I, I think that broadening it out like that to include as many stakeholders as possible and you've done that with your faculties by broadening it across different faculties I think that's important because asking questions and engaging in a conversation can just spark off an idea. Some of the things I found, I would never have guessed that I was going to find them at the very beginning. That whole idea of the attendance badge being something that will encourage the, the good students to come that may be thinking I'll pass anyway, and the influence that they can have in a class group, it never would have occurred to me to do that. Um, the level up badge probably never would have occurred to me, you know, so it was only by asking the different people and having a conversation that it all kind of kind of gelled together I suppose really and it sounds like you're doing that uh, across different faculties as well. Okay I think that we have uh, still uh, some questions from Laura. Uh, you want Laura to? Yes hi everyone um, so ju just to introduce myself I'm actually a colleague of Wayne's in Galway um, I also lecture on the campus and I just wanted to compliment Wayne on his doctorate and digital badges and has now set up a community of practice, you could say, in GMIT. And we went through his um, session back in May. And I actually went through the whole motion of creating a badge, de designing it myself, um, kind of inputted all the little text behind the badge and going through the whole, um, I suppose, role play of, of the badge creation. And certainly, um, for this semester, because we're 100% online in my department, in the business department, I want to um, kind of have that motivation and engagement with my students and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So I certainly plan to do between one and three badges if I don't kind of bite off more than I can chew. But I plan to implement this um, 
<laughs> be coming back to you, Wayne. But I plan to implement okay. it for my students. Um, so it, it was a great um, it was a great session that Wayne did, and I just wanted to say thumbs up and well done. Oh, thanks, Laura. I'll I'll uh, send that fiver over to you later on. A bit more than a fiver now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so there, there is a bit of a community of practice building up in GMIT now. As I said, there's about, we, we set up in a Microsoft Teams group for it that now has about 70 people. But of that 70, as I mentioned, I think maybe 15 to 20 or so are kind of serious about it. Um, Laura being, being one of them, a great example there. Um, so it's great to even get to that stage of 15 or 16. And that's where the working group has come from. So we can move on to the next stage of developing a policy and some guidelines around widening it out. The difficult, I won't go into this in detail because I think I, I can have a conversation with people afterwards about it if they like. But the difficulty is um, credentials and micro-credentials are being viewed in the same way as digital badges by some people and I see a definite reason for separating them out. Uh, none of my badges have anything to do with credentialism or micro-credentialism um, and that's why I think we may even need two policies. One for badges that are recognition of credential or maybe worth 1.5 or 2 ECT ECT credits uh, and the badges I like which have nothing to do with credits they just get people to come to a class and engage and fill in the gaps of what a grade doesn't tell you. I think it was a very very important uh, point just to, to make a clear difference between credentials certificates and badges are as, as you show it, they are basically connectors. They, they can open new potential, recognize new, new, new roles, and they don't have much to do with, with the traditional uh, credential. No, no, no. There is a place for both. both. Both things are, of course, needed. But, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a crossover, but I think it's a very limited way to look at a badge if you're seeing it as only an emblem of uh, a micro-credential. Yeah. Well, I think that we could uh, went stop on this uh, great word. <laughs> Thank you very much for your for your presentation. Really, I, I can't find words. It's a brilliant. It's a very good opening for for our Open Badge Factory uh, webinar season. I mean, it's uh, really very interesting. And uh, well, uh, in your presentation, there is your email address, uh, links uh, to your PhD work, and so on. So I'm sure that. Uh, We'll be contacted by some now, other people to. to I'd, be, I'd be very happy to talk to anybody about any aspect of it, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Thank for the opportunity. I, 